Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crossbridge Church. It's great to see you here again. Um, and we'd like to, to, to join us in worshiping in this, in this worship service that we have here. Now, something I just want to uh, talk about is the whole idea of the worship service. Um, things kind of change, it seems, in church maybe about 15 year, uh, 50 years ago where the whole idea of the worship service changed. So it's actually what the worship service, uh, you know, people think that the worship service is like the people on the stage. It's like an event in which we serve the people in the congregation. But actually the whole, the word worship service comes from the Greek word latreo, which actually has to be like the people in the congregation serving God. So the worship service is supposed to be an active time a time that we're actively listening, we're actively reading the scripture, we're actively praying together, we're actively singing out. So it's actually the people on the stage cheering you on, leading you into, into giving praise to God. So as we stand up, this, let's stand up this morning and let's, let's make this worship service what it is meant to be. It's the work of the people serving God. Walls that we could sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose. And those walls are rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way But he came and he died and he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God, this is who he is He loves us This is our God, this is what he does He saves us He bore the cross let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus Remember that fear that took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper all those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness I never once did he fail and he never will this is our God this is who he is he loves us oh, this is our God this is what he does he says for the cross beat the grave Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God, King Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit? He did, he did Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit? He did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but jesus who rescued me from that grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody our God, this is who he is, he loves us, oh, this is our God, this is what he does, he saves us, he bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus, he bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth King Jesus, 
Let's sing out our thanks to God here. All my words fall short. I've got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. But every song must end, and you never do. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know we much, but I've nothing else fit for the key, except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response, I've got just one my arms stretch wide, I will worship you. So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So you get shy on me lift up your song cause you got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you got a lion inside of those lungs get up and Cause all that I have is hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I've nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing hallelujah. shy on me lift up those songs cause you got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song 
Cause you got a lion inside all those lows. Get up and praise the Lord. It's, it's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. So 
This morning, Father, we love you and we thank you so much for these opportunities and we thank you for the breath that you've given us and the new life that you offer us through salvation in you. And I pray, Father, that as we go throughout today in this service and all the things that you have for us, the things you've planned for us, Father, would you just pour out a fresh anointing on this congregation today, that we leave here restored, we leave here with a, a new hope whatever we may be facing. And I pray that you would just lay out the blueprint that you would have for Pastor Wade this morning as he brings the word and that we would be receptive to this word that you have for us. We thank you, Jesus, for the many blessings that we have. And I ask that in these next few moments throughout this service, that once again, you would just flood this place and let us experience you we have never experienced you before. And we love you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may have a seat. Hey kids, we love having you join us in worship each week. You're now dismissed to Kidsville for some age-specific teaching. How about now? Oh, and you guys were listening to me sing the whole time. Wow. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Wade. I'm the associate pastor to adults here. I have a full-time job as a computer guy for the Air Force, so I am not even really part-time. Uh, I have been here at this church for 20 years, and I, I love playing in the band. I've been up in the tech booth. For a long time, uh, but I felt a calling several years ago to, to preach, and I've been working towards that goal for a long time. Um, but uh, we are in the second week of our Cinderella Stories series, and we love these Cinderella stories, don't we? We just love to see a person who's downtrodden, overlooked, oppressed, by an evil step monster or, or a 
a boss or somebody. We just love to see them f get found and discovered and bloom and put in their right place. Um, and that's really the dream of all of us, right? We want to uh, be found. If only I could get lucky. If only I could win a million dollars, then that would be, you know, if only someone would really see my true potential. Um, and, you know, I, I find it odd. I, I, like to, I would like to one day write a book, uh, like a Christian fantasy book. I love science fiction and fantasy. So I listen to the writing podcasts. And one of the things as a writer is you need to write to what people are reading. And apparently the hottest, uh, most popular thing in, in romance novels now is the billionaire story. Millionaires are so 1900s. It's the billionaire story now, and that's, that's really the Cinderella story, right? The billionaire pulls up and sees some, some scullery maid and, and discovers her for what, what she's worth, and now she gets to go to the Maldives for vacation or whatever. Well, today we're going to talk about David. Yes, David and Goliath, David. Yes, David, the city of David, David. Yes, David and Bathsheba, David. That's the same guy. Um, and we're going to talk about him, uh, just kind of, well, I discovered there's way too much for me to go in, 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 in depth on David, so we're just going to kind of run down the highway and look at some billboards about David, how he can influence us, he is a man of God, can influence our lives, and, and how the Spirit of God showed up in his lives. Um, but you think about it, well, David, he was like 3,000 years ago on the other side of the, of the world in a country that was agrarian. I mean, like their most advanced technology was the wheel, maybe? I don't know. Oil lamp? I don't know. That's, I, I don't know. So what could, we, what could he possibly tell us in our TikTok, Instagram, Facebook world? Well, here's the thing about the Bible. God gave us these stories because people don't change. We all have the same fears. We all have the same loves. We all have the same drives and the same things that influence our personality. Proverbs was written 3,000 years ago. And tell me if these words aren't true, true today. This is from Proverbs 16. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy to the body. Oh, yeah, that's still true today. It was 3,000 years ago. We're still the same. I mean, we think politics are bad today. Eh, look at our own country at the turn of the 1900s. It was brutal. It was slow because you had to Pony Express it to the next town, but it was brutal. And we think that sexual perversions are really bad now. Ever hear of Sodom and Gomorrah? It's, it's all, it's been around. So we can see ourselves in these stories and we, we, we can relate to those, um, to those people. But more importantly, I think we can see what God saw in those people. And, and that's what we're, I hope that we can capture from David today. So let's uh, start off um, talking about David. Now, I didn't know this before I started studying David. There is more written about David than anybody else in the Bible except for God. He's like 1,100 verses, 65 chapters. There's just a lot of stuff. And I'm not going to be able to deep dive in any of it. Otherwise, we'd be here till the cows come home. Um, he wrote like almost half of the Psalms. I didn't realize he wrote that many. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of an information dump. I hope not, but I'm just going to start right off. So we first meet David. Um, okay, I got to set this up first. Okay, so the Israel had 
come into their promised land, and they had prophets for a long time, and all the countries around them have kings. And they're like, God, we want a king too. How come we can't be like them? We want a king. And so God said, no, you don't need a king. Yes, we need a king. And so they finally, so God chose Saul to be their king, the very first king. But Saul started off good, ended up being, getting a big head and being deceitful. And so this is where we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Oh, now I can read it. Now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Yes, same Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there, for I have selected one of his sons to be my king. We're going to skip a bit. There's seven brothers. Samuel looks at the first one. He's tall and handsome and good looking. And God goes, don't look at the outside. Look at the heart. You can still, that's a little nugget there. Don't look at the outside. Look at the heart. So we're going to pick up in verse 11 after we've gone through all seven brothers and rejected them. Then Samuel asked, are these all the sons you have? Well, there is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. I don't know what that has to do with it, but he had beautiful eyes. And the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So David stood there among his brothers. Samuel took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed David with oil. Now listen to this. This is important to the rest of the sermon. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. The spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. So we're going to look what the spirit of the Lord, what that looks like in a person from that day on. He's in, he's, what the spirit of the Lord is in them. So first, we're going to look at the, all these characteristics of what it looks like that where a person had the Spirit of the Lord through David. The first is, what we can learn is be patient. David was anointed as king by Samuel. We just read when he was a tween, I just like saying tween, when he was 10 to 14, somewhere in that range. But he had to wait 20 years until he would become king. And then it was only king of half of the half of the country and Saul was jealous of him and kept trying to kill him but David knowing knowing he was going to be king one day didn't take the opportunities that he had to kill Saul we're going to read about that right now he would have been justified but in 1 Samuel 23, uh, 24, starting in verse 3. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happens, David and his men were hiding further back in the cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut off Saul's robe. He had said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord the king. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one, for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone his way, David came out and shouted to him, My lord, the king! Then when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your very own eyes it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He's the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but it didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you, 
and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. So David was patient. He, he writes, he, he, the Psalms are amazing. Here's, here's what he wrote about being patient in, in the Psalm. Psalm 37, verse 7. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. You think that was hard for him to wait 20 years when he had all opportunities and people behind him wanting him to be king? This shows David's heart. So how do I know the will of the Lord for my life? David says, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act and you will know. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. This is going to be a recurring theme in David's life that he displays the fruit of the Spirit. Is there something that you need to be patient about? It is hard to wait. But if we have the Holy Spirit, then we have patience. Our next uh, thing that we can take from David is we can have unwavering faith in God. And this is when we get to Goliath. So, so David's still just a, just a tween, just a teenager. His dad says, go take some food to your brothers and, at the army. They're fighting the Philistines. And he gets there, and the Philistines have one guy out there, and everybody is afraid of him. We all know the story. And David um, it's like, why aren't you guys fighting him? Why? What? And he finds out that if you go out and fight and kill Goliath, then you get one of King Saul's daughters. And he's asking around, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? And finally, Saul hears about it and brings him in. And so here's, here's a conversation that David has with Saul. 1 Samuel 17. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it again to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. So for some reason, Saul said, okay, may the Lord be with you. So we're going to skip to the battle. Saul says, you got to wear my armor. David says, oh, it's too big. I can't, this is made for a man. I'm still a boy. I can't do this. So he just takes his shepherd's staff and his sling and walks out there to Goliath. And of course, we all know he's got five stones. Now he looks at Goliath who's nine feet tall. He's got a, a huge spear. They say it's the size of a weaver's beam. It's like a two-by-four. You're holding a two-by-four with a 15-pound uh, arrowhead on the end. He's got a huge sword, and he's got a javelin for throwing. And he's got somebody out in front of him holding a shield. So, so here, here we are at the battle. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give you your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Every, everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescued his people 
but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. So you know the rest of the story. David takes his sling and fires a stone and hits Goliath right in the middle of the forehead. Now, apparently, if you're good at a sling, you can hurl a stone 100 miles an hour. So we can see what the damage that could do. So Goliath falls over dead. All the Israelites come out and, and rally and send the Philistines running. Now, did David, was it just hubris? Was it just the innocence of a tween that he didn't understand the danger that he was in? It's telling us that he had past experiences where the Lord had delivered him. He was fully embracing the faithfulness of God in his life that he knew this was what he was supposed to do. And no fear, because he knew that God was on his side. Do you have any Goliaths in your life right now? Do you have any times you can look back into your own life and see where God provided, delivered you, that you can now use that for your modern day, your current Goliath, just like David did. I think if we opened up the room to tell those stories, we would be here till the cows come home because all of us have stories where God has provided for us. And if we can remember that in our in our struggles for today, we can remember those victories of yesterday. We know that God is merciful and still with us. Well, the next trait that we can gather from David is worship God fervently. Worship God fervently. So this is later on. David had captured Jerusalem which he named Zion, but everybody to this day knows it as the city of David. Um, and so he had built it up, and he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city because he wanted the Lord to have a special place there in, in Jerusalem. And so this, is, this scene is David bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. We pick it up in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts of joy and the blowing of ram's horns. But as the ark of the Lord entered the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked down from her window when she saw King David and, and leaping and dancing before the Lord, she, she was filled with contempt for him. Let's skip down to verse 20. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet him. She said in disgust, how distinguished the king of Israel looks today, shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before the Lord. He chose me above your father and all his family. He appointed me as the leader of Israel, the people of the Lord. So I celebrated before the Lord. Yes, I am willing to look even more foolish than this, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. But those servant girls you mentioned will indeed think I am distinguished. Now, I don't know why David thought all he needed to wear was what amounted to was an apron leading the, the procession, but it wasn't for show, it was for celebration. And it had the priestly uh, things on there uh, so that he could be identified. He was worshiping with all his might. And so what does is, what is that worship fervently look like for us? We're not dancers. We're not, there's other churches that, that do that. 
but that doesn't mean we can't worship fervently. We see in all these writings that David worshiped the Lord. He worshiped by giving thanks, by writing songs, by singing songs, by remembering the wonders that God had done, by praising God, by declaring his glory. He rightly knew his place in relation to God and understood that God was in control. And all things David accomplished and was praised and celebrated for were because of God. That's why he worshiped fervently. Our next thing we can learn from David is to show kindness. Now, when David first uh, started working for Saul as an armor bearer and then as a, as a captain in his army, he became very close friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. So much so that when Saul was out hunting and trying to kill David, Jonathan would tell, would tell David when he was coming. And he, he gave David gifts. And so they were like soul, soul brothers. They were best friends. Now this happens, what we're going to read, this happens after David is king, and that is after Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle by the Philistines. This is years later. So it's 2 Samuel chapter 9. One day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba, the king asked? Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. And the king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replied, yes, one of, Saul's, one of Jonathan's son is, is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he, the king asked, in Lodibar. Ziba told him, at the home of Michar, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Michar's house, home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Now, some who know me would, tell, would think that I would want to tell the story of Mephibosheth because I like saying Mephibosheth. It sounds funny. And there wouldn't be wrong, there wouldn't be wrong but there is a really a deeper story with Mephibosheth. Was there any reason for David to show kindness to any relative of Saul? No, there wasn't. Saul wanted to kill him. He was jealous of him. So jealous, he traveled with an army all over the countryside. But David who was called a man after God's own heart, wanted to honor the friendship he had with Jonathan and show kindness to a relative of Saul. Not just David's kindness, but he says he wanted to show God's kindness. So where does this kindness come from? What does it look like? We read in Galatians 5, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. When we have the Spirit of God in our lives, these are the things that are produced. Remember when David was first anointed, it said, and the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Okay, a small aside for a moment. Okay, so the teenagers this month are studying Fruit of the Spirit, Wednesday nights, right? So, 
what us adults are doing is we're getting out our phones and we're going on to the YouVersion app, which I know you all have installed on your, on your phone, and we are friending the church and we are doing a study of the fruit of the Spirit along with them. So if you do not know how to do this, there are 73 friends of the church right now. I know there's more because there's more people sitting here. So tomorrow we're starting patience. Um, and so I want you all to do this. Get on new version app after church uh, and add a friend request to the church, Crossbridge Church. I'll, I'll see it, we'll accept you, and we'll start this tomorrow. If you cannot figure this out, go find a teenager because they live on their phones, okay? I think we should set up a booth maybe in the, in the cafe with teenagers just to help us old farts with phones, <laughs> okay? Let's, let's make that happen, all right? Let's do that, okay? So we don't have to guess because our grandchildren and our, some of our children are away from us. Some of our grandchildren don't live close to us so we can ask. So let's, let's do that. All right. Now back to the sermon. Okay, Jesus tells us about kindness in Luke. Luke chapter 6, verse 35. Love your enemies, do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are thankful, unthankful and wicked. He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Paul shows that true Christians have kindness in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He says, we live in such a way that, there will, that no one will stumble because of us and no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, we've been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to ex exhaustion, endured sleep sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. There was a recent Barna poll uh, that asked this question. What causes people with no faith tradition to doubt Christianity? What causes people with no faith tradition to doubt Christianity? And there were answers like science and things which you expect. But the number one answer was the hypocrisy of religious people. And we've all heard stories of the church lunch crowd getting out of church, going into the restaurant, and then being mean to the, wait the waiters and the wait staff. That's hypocrisy. We can do better than that. <laughs> and I think we can overcome this perception of hypocrisy with kindness. It's not very hard to do, especially when we have the Holy Spirit in us providing kindness. Okay, our next uh, thing that we can get from David um, is to repent completely. So David wasn't always perfect. He wasn't always a good guy. He messed up. Didn't discipline his kids. Had problems with that for years. Didn't go to a battle when he should have. And he was up on the roof and he sees a woman bathing on top of her roof. And he abused his kingly powers and had her brought to him. And then she got pregnant and he tried to cover it up by killing her husband, which he ended up doing. Now, the prophet Nathan had to remind him that he, needed, that he did wrong 
But when he, when he saw that, when he realized that, he repented completely. And we can read the pain in his soul as he cries out to God in Psalm 51, which is, which is a direct uh, repentance to God about this very event with Bathsheba. Psalm 51. Have mercy, mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love. Because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me day and night. Against you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judge Judgment against me is just. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you're, you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be kept clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back the joy, my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Sound familiar? Don't banish me from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to rebels, and they will return to you. Forgive me for shedding blood, O God, who saves. Then I will Joyfully sing of your forgiveness. Unseal my lips, O Lord, that my mouth might praise you. You do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. Look favor on Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with sacrifices offered in the right spirit, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. And the bulls will again be sacrificed in your altar. This is what true repentance looks like. And even at the end, he was... He knew God was going to do it. He said, oh, also do the city, do the people that I'm in charge of, do them too. Is there anything you need to repent of today? Don't wait. Look at our example of David and cry out to God in repentance. And he will create a clean heart in you and restore the joy of his salvation in you. Our next attribute of David that we can attain is be humble. We see from the very beginning, he's just a shepherd boy from a, a no-name tribe from a no-name town called Bethlehem at the time. And we read in, in 1 Samuel 18, now this is when he was a captain in Saul's army and Saul was like, I'm going to give you a daughter. I'm going to give you a daughter to be your wife. And David says, who am I? What is my family in Israel that I should be the king's son-in-law? David exclaimed, my father's family is nothing. That's humility. That's not false humility. That's humility. And later on, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, then King David, King David, went in and sat before the Lord and prayed, who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And now, Sovereign Lord, in addition to everything else, you speak of giving your servants a lasting dynasty? Do you deal with everyone this way, O Sovereign Lord? What more can I say to you? You know that your servant 
you know what your servant is really like, Sovereign Lord. Because of your promise and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known to your servant. These two, these two occurrences are like probably 30 years apart. So there's a continual history of humility. And this is after, this, when he's the king, this, I think this is after the Lord made a covenant with David saying that you're out of your house in the tribe of Judah, there will be, the kingdom will never end. And we'll talk about that a little later. It just blows my mind that here's a king who has everything that the world can offer him, anything imaginable, and he calls himself nothing before the Lord. All right, our last, our last thing that we can gain from David is talk to God. We can talk to God. If we look at all those 75 or so psalms that David wrote, we can see that he talked to God about all kinds of things. He wrote songs and poems asking for help, asking for wisdom to dedicate a temple to give praise to God. Let's just, let's just run down a few here. Here's Here's uh, Psalm 142. We talked about when he was in the cave before and he cut off the hymn. This is a, this is a prayer that uh, David wrote to the Lord. I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him. I tell him all my troubles. When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit what happens to me. Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I want in life. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. He pours out his complaints, tells him all his troubles. Let's look in Psalm 6. O oh Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O oh Lord, until you restore me? Return, O oh Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love. For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred with grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. He's talking to God, telling him the pain in his life. Telling him, I'm crying out, please help me, God. Not in a way that it would be nice if you could help me, knowing that he can help me and waiting for the day that he can. One last psalm, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from dang danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the, one, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the, the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Let's skip, skip to verse 11. Teach me how to live, O oh Lord. Lead me along the right path, for my enemies are waiting. Do not let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath they threaten me with violence. 
Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness. While I am here in the land of the living, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. It's like he's telling himself, okay, wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. But he's also telling us that. You can really see David's heart in these writings. You see, he doesn't hold anything back. And he was always giving God praise at the end. So when we look at David's life, a man who was filled with the Spirit of God, we see the fruit of the Spirit exhibited. It's just amazing. And I just thank God for, for this example that we can look to. And not just, to, a lot of times we just get a little glimmer of, of a person, we get, but we get this full spectrum of David, his life, and all his emotions and his highs and his lows, because then we can relate to that. Be patient. Have unwavering faith in God. Worship God fervently. Show kindness. Repent completely. Be humble and talk to God. These are the things that I think uh, we can learn from David today. Knowing a little more about David casts the most famous psalm in a different light. So David was the author of the 23rd Psalm. He was a shepherd and he was a king who did everything in the, who had everything that the world could offer him. But let's read Psalm 23 through the lens of David that we know today. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close by my side. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today knowing that you know us so intimately and asking you to help us see how we can love you more, more fully, how we can live life to the fullest by looking at the example you gave us through David. We just thank you for giving us a complete picture this, of David that all his highs and his lows and his, his good things and his bad things and that we might know that you can be beside us if we just ask, if we talk to you, if we tell you what we're going through, if we receive your Holy Spirit, then we will have these fruits of the Spirit that will enrich in our lives, that we can shine the light of your glory for the whole world to see, that we can correct the wrong perception that some people have of us as believers, that they will know that you are true and mighty. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for being with us today. We thank you for this word. 
We ask that you would help us to bring it into our hearts today. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Will you stand as we continue our worship?
remind you that we have an example to look at when you don't know how to talk to God, when you feel oppressed. We can look at this Cinderella story of David and look at his example. I bid you peace, go in peace and the joy of the Lord. You are dismissed. Well, before you go, thanks, Wade. Before you go, we are going to, you guys can be seated. We'll just, uh, great job, Wade. Thank you for that word. Thanks for the order of service. Yeah, you're, <laughs> you're doing great. Hey, they know, they knew what to do. Um, we didn't know, no, it's good. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us today. We really are so grateful that you're here. And once again, Wade, seriously, thank you for that word. And uh, just the... There were some things in there that I didn't know about David's life, so thank you for bringing that out. Um, this is a portion of our service. We typically uh, try to just take our tithes and offerings, a continuation of our worship. If you're new with us today, we're so thankful that you've joined us. And uh, if you haven't already connected with somebody uh, from our team, our hospitality team, um, and we would just love to connect with you further if you're new, uh, right in front of you in the seat backs uh, there, there is a spot for you. Just fill this out. It says new here, start here. Just some very simple information. Uh, when the offering baskets come by, you can just drop that in. And of course, if you're not new here, we are so thankful that you make Crossbridge your church home. And um, if there's anything else that you want to do in your faith, like next steps as far as baptism um, or taking our journey or anything like that, or if you just got a praise that you want to just share with us, we'd love to hear from you. You can also fill out one of these cards and drop it into that offering as well. But if you don't mind, ushers, go ahead, come forward. Uh, we have some announcements. Announcement video will play for you. Thank you all. Hi, my name is Andrea, and we are so glad that we could worship together this morning. Our prayer is that God spoke to you in a powerful way, helping you move from where you are to where he wants you to be. If you're new to Crossbridge, we'd love to get to know you. Stop by any of the blue New Here, Start Here tables on your way out today so that we can get connected. And now, here's the rest of this morning's announcements. Here are some great outreach opportunities for June. Family Promise is looking to help individuals in need of meals from June 11th to July 2nd. New Life Mission and Aging Matters are seeking donations of some specific items. You can check out the full list in the lobby for more details and ways to sign up. Serve as a small group, a few buddies, or as a family. Email outreach at crossbridgenaz.org. That's outreach at crossbridgenaz.org for more information. Are you in a life group, social circle, serving team, or class? There's never been a better time to get involved. God calls us to be together, discipling, and enjoying community with one another. For more information on all of the current groups, visit the website or email groups at crossbridgenaz.org. That's groups at crossbridgenaz.org. Want more information? Scan the QR code on the back of your sermon notes for links about everything we've talked about. You can also check out our website and subscribe to our social media. Okay, practice makes perfect. Okay, now go and learn more about David. Use his example to help you in your own life. Be blessed. You are dismissed. <laughs>
Thank you.